Experts in the Middle East are using drones to unravel the secrets of a mystery civilization. Imagine if ancient Egypt had gone undiscovered. That's what's happened in Saudi Arabia, a country with a rich, age-old history that many people simply don't know about. But a tech-centric excavation should change all that, as light aircraft and drones hover over the area. They've already pinpointed some incredible pieces of history that have remained hidden for centuries. Indeed, the Nabataean people once roamed the area over which these devices now hover, but it looked very different under their watch. The ancient tribe lived nomadically for years before settling down and into a life that focused on trade and agriculture. They also built some incredible structures and sacred sites, some of which have already caught archaeologists' attention. But so much of the Nabataeans' presence remains undiscovered, and that may in part be down to the tribe choosing to live in a landscape so rough that it caused the Romans to retreat from an intended invasion. Now, though archaeologists have no need to worry about traversing such an unforgiving terrain. Instead, they're using drones to find out the secrets of this ancient tribe. During the 4th century BC, a slew of nomadic tribes wandered their way across the Arabian desert, constantly in search of water and pasture for their herds. Among them were Nabataeans, a people whose origin remains shrouded in mystery. Some say they came from Yemen, but they shared nothing language, deities, script with this region. Others hypothesize that the Nabataeans started out in a region on the eastern side of the Arabian Peninsula known as Hejaz. This possibility makes more sense as the Hejaz locals worship the same gods as the wandering Nabataeans. Plus, the tribe's name contains a root consonant NBTW, once used in the area's Semitic language. Regardless of the Nabataeans' origins, they made a huge impact when they reached prosperity, more than any of the nomadic Arabian tribes who roamed during their ancient time. For one thing, they built the city we know today as Petra, Jordan. They quickly constructed the stunning metropolis in the first century BC, and it grew to house 20,000 people. Petra became the de facto seat of the Nabataean civilization, but it wasn't the only city established by the one-time nomadic tribe. They also built Hegra, known today as Mada'in Salah, and it became the secondary capital and second largest settlement. Hegra also marked the Nabataean kingdom's southernmost point. Within the Nabataeans' borders, they created a rich culture of their own. Among themselves, the people spoke a version of Arabic, but they didn't write that way. Their script, in fact, reflects a blend of Aramaic and Arabic words and forms. And when they met with other ethnic groups in the area, they could communicate in Aramaic. The tribe also conducted its politics in the language. The Nabataeans alphabet even inspired what would later become Arabic script. And although they adapted the Aramaic alphabet, their proprietary script writing paved the way for the Arabic alphabet as it's written now. So, in short, they spoke a form of Arabic, wrote in Aramaic, and helped develop Arabic language. In spite of the Nabataeans' language and writing skills, few remnants of their literature has made it to the present day. Other classical texts make reference to them, though, and outsiders' perspectives give a good idea of the culture that the Nabataeans cultivated. For one thing, the community followed well-guarded trade routes and never shared the origin of the goods they sold. Diodorus Siculus, a historian from ancient Greece, in fact, wrote about the Nabataeans. In his description, the author painted a vivid picture of a strong community of 10,000 warriors. In addition, he pointed out that the culture entirely rejected the idea of agriculture and permanent houses. Instead, they focused on their pastoral roots, as well as the lucrative trade in spices, frankincense, and myrrh, all of which they gathered from an area in modern Yemen. The Nabataeans definitely knew how to ward off outsiders, but that didn't mean they completely shut them out. In fact, some of their culture reflected the outside influences they absorbed, especially from their lengthy Red Sea trading routes. For one thing, their religion drew from their own beliefs, but also included the practices of their Arabian neighbors. In the Nabataean capital of Petra, the people worshipped two main gods, Al Uzza and Dushara. The latter was a deity exclusive to their people and stood as the kingdom's official god. The figure is likely to have represented the heavens, although some believe he may have had links to the forest instead. Either way, the Nabataeans used, among other symbols, the eagle to represent the god Dushara. The bird's form also appears across the city of Hegra, especially on tombs. 
The people thought the symbolic representation of their god would protect their final resting places from potential thievery. But Dushara wasn't the only god worshipped by the Nabataeans. They also praised Alusa, and this wasn't a practice exclusive to their tribe. Pre-Islamic peoples across the area honored the goddess, who even earned a mention in the sacred Islamic text, the Quran. She also has a stone cube in her honor close to Mecca. Petra still has plenty of examples of these god blocks, some of which have had faces added to their simple frames. For all of its peaceful sites of worship, though, the Nabataean capital and the many of the tribe's other important cities also saw plenty of conflict, too. For instance, in 90 BC, Nabataean king Obotus I defeated Alexander Janius, the Hasmonean king, in an ambush that destroyed the tribe's enemy, the Judeans. Thirty years later, Egyptian queen Cleopatra gave the green light to Herod the Great, the Judean ruler, to go on the offensive against the Nabataeans. As a result, Herod and his cavalry occupied and pillaged the trade-centric tribal kingdom. The Nabataeans then gathered in Canatha, Syria, but Herod's forces once again prevailed over them. Fortunately, the Nabataeans received a lifeline. The Canathans rushed to help the tribe. The local Syrian forces overpowered Herod and his troops, pushing them out of the area for a year. They would fight with the Nabataeans again, though, when the warriors stormed into Israel and sparked a standoff. And even though the drones and aircraft have helped experts learn more about Petra and al Ula, their job is far from over. Excavator and educator at King Saud University, Abdul Rahman al Sulhaibani, told the BBC, What makes this work so important on the world stage is that it will provide an account of not just Madain, Salah, and Petra, but earlier civilizations that are largely unknown to us. As such, Abdul Rahman takes his university students along to the al Ula sites for further training. And it's an education that will serve them well since the area's excavation is far from over. In fact, he predicts an incredible future for the site. The archaeologist said, Today's students may well make discoveries that we can't even imagine. Check out these other videos from Let Me Know. If you haven't made the move to subscribe to our channel, all you need to do is click on that red subscribe button. Thank you for watching.